African literature. So many incredible books. But you know, the point of Kaaba Fest is to bring people together from all over the world, and especially from the different parts of our beloved continent. So it gives me great pleasure to first invite the host, Professor to be Sada Malumfashi. And all the way from South Africa, via Zambia, via Zimbabwe, most recently Nairobi, join me in welcoming my sister, Zukizwa Vana. And our own local champion next. Local champion to be international icon. It's a good friend with a new amazing book that I think is going to blow you away. Please, let's give Namdi Oguike a rousing Kaba Fest welcome. Hello, Kaduna. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with these two wonderful writers that I really respect. Welcome, Zuki. Welcome, Namdi. So I'll just go straight right in into their profiles. So Zuki Suawana is a South African publisher and novelist with four novels in The Madams, Behind Every Successful Man, Men of the South, and London, Cape Town, Cape Town, Job, which we'll be discussing today. <laughs> Her novels have been shortlisted for the South African Literary Awards and the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. In 2015, she won the K. Selo Duke Memorial Literary Award for London, Cape Town, Joburg. She's also the writer of nonfiction in 8115 Prisoner's Story and Hardly Walking, published in 2015. In 2014, Wana was named on the Africa 39 list of 39 Sub Saharan African writers aged under 40 with potential and talent to define trends in African literature. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Zuki Suawana. On my left is Inamdi Oguke, a Nigerian writer who was selected as the Missing Slate's Author of the Month for March 2016, finalist in the 2018 Africa Book Club Short Story Competition. His writing has appeared in the Dalho Dalhousie Review, Africa Writer, Brito Paper, and The Wrong Patient and Other Stories. He lives in Akwa, Nigeria. Welcome, Namdi. <laughs> Namdi has a collection of short stories while we'll be discussing Zukiswa's novel, London, Cape Town, Johannesburg. London, Cape Town, Johannesburg has a story that follows the intriguing lives of husband and wife, Martin and Jermaine, and their son, Zuko. The couple's love story and near-perfect marriage begins in London, progresses to Cape Town, and then to fast-paced post-liberation Johannesburg. We are, set, we are let in on their experiences with extended families, friends, communities, and countries. It's a gripping narration that covers theme of sexuality, race, family, trust, love, marriage, parenting, business, career, art betrayal, and death. It's also a beautiful love story, but also a book with insightful and political viewpoints. You all need to get a copy so that she will send the book for you later on. <laughs> Inamdi Oguke's first book is a collection of short stories titled, Do Not Say It's Not Your Country. It is filled with fascinating characters such as an opinionated South African woman and her children crowding an iron shark in Bilkes Dub, a Madagascan slum boy who gets a job as a cook in Antananarivo, a shy Sierra Leone girl who falls, who falls in love with a sh sly fisherman, a wily Nigerian prophet whose tricks are exposed, and a Kenyan couple back in their old days, old ways after confirmation in church, and many more with themes such as love, innocence, terrorism, and slavery. Of course, Namdi Books is also available in the bookstore. Get a copy. <laughs> so I'll delve right into the discussion. I think I'll start with you, Zuki. Um, London Captain Joburg is an, was an interesting read. And starting with the prologue, um, you weave the story so in, in ext as intricately 
that one keeps predicting, okay, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next. You follow the love story because the prologue begins at the end of the story and then you mm -hmm. follow the story and it keeps narrating and going through. So I kept predicting how the ending will be. I, I think I was writing it in a book in different points. Okay, it might end this way, it might end this way. So I just wanted to know, how did you go about such style where the beginning was a teaser that propelled the reader forward? Um, I think I'm constantly challenging myself as a writer and... Uh, in London, Cape Town, Joburg, I wanted to see how I could, uh, when starting with such a devastating ending, be able to hold the reader's attention right through um, to the end. So yeah, so I was I was playing with with narrative. I was playing with everything that I've thought that I've wanted to do, and I wanted to see how it would work. Yeah, interesting concept, um, Namdi. Yours is a short story collection. But what I found interesting b basically on that is the characters in your, in your novel, different settings. Almost all the stories were set in a different African country. So it's a delightful read of Africa stories from South Africa, Madagascar, across the Atlantic Ocean in Freetown, Lagos, Abuja, Northern Nigeria. So what is your experience with Africa? Is it, have you traveled a lot across Africa? Because each story, depending on the location, is so real, so true that you you assume the writer has been in, in that position. So I wanted to know, do you have experience traveling across Africa, and how did you come about these stories like that? Well, I think that's a, a good compliment, if, if it makes you feel like I've been all around the continent. But I haven't, that's a fact. Um, I've gathered stories from my father, from my father, in, you know, was was in Hawaii for a while, you know, and my family have some. Do you know, I went to school in Hawaii. Oh wow, wow, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have I have an auntie who lives, who is married, you know, to a Hawaiian, and 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 her son lives in Honolulu. So my father visited, you know, and and came back with stories. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I haven't been to all these countries. I haven't been to South Africa, but I have a friend who lived in South Africa for a while and came to stay with me. And South Africa, and I, I was telling uh, as a earlier that S Nigeria and South Africa are like, like siblings. You know, we have a lot. Of, I mean, I've, I've watched a goalie when I was a child. Mm. I, there are many soap operas, you know. Uh, yeah, and even till date, I still, I still watch, what's it? Uh, I still watch, what's the name again? You know, uh, Rhythm City and all that. Yeah. You know, so culturally, Nigeria and South Africa, I mean, share a lot in common. I mean, you know, so... Uh, and I also read a lot, you know, as much as I can, you know, what's going on on the continent, uh, recent historical events, you know, and all that. So these things are, are things that are giving me an idea. And I, th I don't think it's anything new. I, I read that Shakespeare, Shakespeare got, insp got inspiration from Plutarch, you know, who was, I think, a historian. You know, he, he, wrote, he wrote a book called the, li the lives of noble Greeks and Romans, you know, and, and Shakespeare got the idea for Julius Caesar, Timon of uh, Athens, and uh, Coriolanus, and uh, lots of that, you know. So, so a writer can get, you know, his or her material from, from reading, from experiences. I've been drawn, driven by an ambition, so to speak, because, I mean, trying to try to push myself, you know, to discover other cultures that I think Africans, we have a lot in common. Some, some people don't believe in the Af African thing. You know, of course, Africa is huge, but there's so many things we can say are, are commonalities. And I feel that people say, write what you free, but I also like to say, write what you're curious to know. Interesting. Yeah. Talking about Nigerian, South African siblings, we also have Big Brother, <laughs> which was something you brought up in your, in your story camp in Bilkesdorp set in South Africa. So you brought up Big Brother in that story, and the character's mother thought it's Big Brother is a very, Big Brother Africa is a very innovative idea of putting together people from different countries in Africa in one house. This had me thinking also about Pan-Africanism, but then she hated the smoking and drinking and girls showing their bums like prostitutes. So my question is, do you think there's a single definition, the single definition of Pan-Africanism, and how do you appre uh, approach your own Pan-Africanism? Well, I, I don't go about it intellectualizing it. I, I, I think by, by writing a collection like this, you know, I've tried to do what I call, sh you know, sharing our common humanity. You know, it's, it's shocking what's, what's going on or what, what happened recently in South Africa. You know, it gives a bad picture. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not going on, I, I don't think. I, okay, is it going on? Okay, okay, that's unfortunate. You know, you know but, but the thing is, you know, it's about our shared humanity. That's, that's, that's actually the thing that is, that runs through, I think, you know, in the book. People, 
you know, I just, we are, come on. I mean, you just say, and that's why the title is Do Not Say It's Not Your Country, because there's no reader of my book that's going to be a citizen of all the countries. So there's a tendency to say, this is not my country, it doesn't concern me. I mean, it's not, and some people have become Afrophobic nowadays. You know, some people say it's not, it's not xenophobia, it's actually Afrophobia. So I think there's a lot in common, and not just as Africans, but as humans. I, I try to underscore that humanity is more important than, than Afri I mean, just saying we're African. Of course, it's important, but it doesn't mean that if you see a foreigner like an American or a British man or, or a Jamaican or whoever, you know, doesn't belong to you, uh, and, and so you write him off or you attack him or you say he doesn't belong here. So the book is actually a ploy to invite people to go through these countries as much as they can and identify with them and become friends with them. That's why it says it, it's, it's do not say it's not your country. So, I mean, I can't, I, can't, I can't write about all the countries in Africa. I wish I could. If I, I was in Ghana two months ago and, and I was feeling like, ah, if I knew, I would have said the story in Ghana, <laughs> which is uh, like the home of Kwame Nkrumah, the father of, uh, of Pan-Africanism. But I mean, by doing that, I'm not trying to hit people you know, with this uh, topic about uh, Pan-Africanism. I'm, I'm happy that it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a discussion on it, you know, subsequently, but. Um, Zuki, maybe the same question through a different approach. Um, the characters in your novel will have a black male, married, black male, ah, don't British. Stuff. <laughs> Not much, <laughs> just a little. <laughs> married to a white British woman who keeps emphasizing to their biracial son that an African in South Africa is not the other, but that we are all Africans. So how do you now approach your own Pan-Africanism through your own writing? Well, I think um, from, from each of my, my books that I've written, uh, it's, it's generally been obvious, but that's because I'm a, I'm a bit of a, an itinerant on the continent. I've, um, I was born in Zambia, my mom is Zimbabwean. Um, my dad is South African and I stay in Kenya now and I'm in Kaduna today. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. So, um, so for that reason, um, I like, you know, we, we're each different, but we have something common and it's been my constant work, even beyond, um, beyond perhaps my writing, even in my literary activism to see how we can harness our energies. And so, you know, of course, one of the lovely little projects that I've been doing was Afro Young Adults, which is published by Lola and uh, is being launched at Akea Festival um, because we don't have enough books on the continent for young adults. And it's coming in, um, in, in three languages, uh, in, in English, French, and uh, uh, Swahili because we haven't been having even conversations with our siblings from the continent who are not from Anglophone speaking uh, countries. So that's important. Um, but what's also very interesting is the publisher for, 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 the, for, the, for the French is in Senegal, but is from Northern Nigeria, you know? And, um, and he's also doing a project now of novels uh, for young adults. So what a lot of people don't understand is the average age of this continent is 19.4 years old. And yet we have quite a few children's books and we have quite a lot of adult books. We don't have anything for these people that we're trying to, you know, who are going to be running and who are frustrated and who are being led by old men mostly on this continent, and um, who get into a space where they get frustrated and they don't have jobs and, you know, some of the problems that we have on the continent are very, very similar. I was listening to the last panel and I was, I was thinking about the frustrations in South Africa and in Kenya and in Zambia and in Zimbabwe Every time I listen, and in Malawi, and in Tanzania, every time I listen to young people, and it's like, they're ignored, but yet, they're the people that really are the majority. And we are about to implode as a continent if we don't actually start listening to them. Quite telling. Yeah. Yeah. That brings me to the issue of also languages and identity, and it's something you also play around in the novel. Um, issues of race, identity. Uh, the character grew up in London and he wanted to give his child a different 
identity, the identity of home, to take him back to the homeland, which was South Africa. But interestingly, by taking him back to South Africa, he does not escape all of those issues. The issues of identity still crawled and found Zuko even in South Africa. So do you think as individuals, do we ever escape the pull of identity crisis, whether at home or in the diaspora? I, it's interesting. Leila and I were having a conversation, and, and, and Rona and I were having a conversation earlier about this. And uh, when you are in Kenya, I had a situation which I was telling them where I was in, in line uh, for the bank inquiries. And um, there was a white woman who came, and she went, as whiteness does, right to the front of the queue, and she decided she was one. And I say to her, I looked at her, and I said, Madam. And she said, Yes. And I said, are we too black for you to see, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so she then did that, you know, the, the, the blinking, the, you know, type of thing. So she said, I just want to ask a quick question. I said, no, but we all want to ask a quick question. This is inquiries. Uh, what was crazy in this situation was uh, my fellow Africans say to me, no, just let her go, you know? And we get this, we get it in restaurants where... You know, we might be uh, the boss in a situation, but our white PA is given the check. We get it in uh, relationships where if we're with a white partner, he's the one who's deferred to, and then you're, it's assumed if you're a black woman, then you must be a sex worker, you know, and so forth and so on. So it's, it's we, I think we need to just unlearn a lot of our, a lot of our, uh, biases first towards each other. We need to be nicer to each other. In fact, one of the things with the Afrophobic attacks in, in South Africa is, you know, uh, there are a lot of, there's an area in Joburg um, near Eastgate Mall where there are a lot of uh, drug dealers from, um, from, from Eastern Europe and Italy, you know. None of those people ever get attacked during Afrophobic attacks, you know. And, and, and so it's this thing that we've just decided, no, my brother is an easier person. When you're at the bottom, you look at somebody lower than you to step on, and we need to get over that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, maybe to lighter topics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Another commonality in all your novel is the experiences of the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. They are both projected in the books, which I found quite interesting, from Martin O'Malley's British raised football enthusiast point of view to Jabulani's football crazed displaced South African point of view. So maybe let me start with you. So what have been your experiences of the African World Cup, and how did you draw inspiration from that to form your stories? <laughs> that's, that's, that's a difficult one. I'm not, I'm not a big football fan, in fact, you know. Interesting. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, of I mean we are... I'm not, I, I, I love, no, don't get me wrong, I love football, but unfortunately, <laughs> they are the kind of people, you know, that like watching matches uh, when it's finals, <laughs> or, or when it's just getting close to the finals, you know, so, I mean, I mean, I mean and we haven't been doing very well, so it's been, been, been depressing, <laughs> so, but, but as... We're as sorry that we beat you <laughs> at AFCON. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, so, so, but, I mean... The World Cup was fascinating for me, uh, especially the 2010 World Cup, because, I mean, our, our country, I mean, our South Africa, that's why you know, it's difficult for me to relate to South Africa as another country. It's like, it's like our thing. We own it. <laughs> we co-own it, rather. Like, so I won't worsen the Afrophobia problem. But it was a big one for us. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, was it um, Becky, rather? Yeah, I think that time, you know, when he was announcing it and celebrating. I mean, I felt like it was our own president doing that. So, so I drew inspiration from that. And, and with reflect to my story, there was some controversy about Blicky's Dove. So, I mean, it just inspired me, the World Cup thing. And there was this story that, that um, the poor people were evicted from somewhere and putting in that in tin shack, you know, in the tin, tin, yeah, you know, so the tourists won't see them. I mean, I mean, it was depressing for me. And that was actually the inspiration, not the World Cup per se, but the World Cup when it began was, uh, was a huge inspiration. And I remember South Africa scored the first goal, right? Yeah, yeah Shabalala, I remember that. <laughs> Ski dance. So, I mean, you can't afford, afford not to get inspiration from little bits of those things. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Zuki, yours is more of a roller coaster about the 1994 World Cup, the 1998 World Cup, the 2002, 2010 World Cup, all through the novel. I want to know how you went around. Okay, um, so 
I, I mentioned 1994. The book is set between 1994 and 2010 for the simple reason that these have been the two high points for South Africans in general, where for a while we kind of forgot our other issues. So we're all very nice to each other. In 1994, just after... You know, when, when people went to vote, those first elections, everybody was amazing to each other. And then in 2010, you know, people are like, you had, you, had, you had white people who went to, what you call it, who went to, the who went to Soweto, to Orlando Stadium, because they were like, oh, yeah, we're going to whatever. And then you had um, people in the townships, of course, like, yes, you can have beer at my Shabin type of thing, you know. So, so those were the two high points, and I wanted to show how, you know, for a nation, it could be something so amazing, but in human, the, the smaller human lives that happen, where things, the dynamics might not quite be the same, you know? Interesting. I um, also want to talk about publishing, which you started earlier. Um, you have a new publishing house, working with the Afro Young Adult Antonio. If you could talk about that before I ask the question. Okay. All right. Uh, so. The the Afro Young Adult is just me as a as a as a project overseer because I decided that we didn't have enough um, books for children. But I'm not I'm not publishing it. Weeder Books is, and uh, two other publishers. Uh, there's EMD in uh, uh, Tanzania and uh, Senegal, as I mentioned before. But my own publishing house is um, I have of course reissued my stuff, I got all my rights back for most of it. Um, but in addition to that, um, I have um, done, I have co-published a children's book, which is actually inside there, and for all of you who want relevant children's stories, it's absolutely amazing, called Story, 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 Come. I co-published it, I have, I'm the Eastern Southern African publisher, and with a s children's imprint, Tanja is the uh, West African publisher, so please, there are 12 stories from um, 12 writers from eight African countries, and they're reimagined stories, and some of them are amazing. Well, they're all amazing, but some of them are, are very relevant to different issues, you know, friendship, um, you know, if we're trying to have a generation of next kids who are perhaps more upright than our fathers and mothers, um, they need to read that. <laughs> oh, and then I've got, um, um, I'm reissuing Mukoma's uh, book as well, um, <laughs> which was formerly, which was known in the U.S. as Mrs. Shaw, I don't know oh, why, yeah. <laughs> and I'm reissuing it as with a card because, and it's very relevant to the rest of the continent, I think. Yep. Still on the publishing, um, there's always been, the, I, I wanted to also, when you said you got your rights back, um, with young writers, emerging writers coming up, um, there's that issue of worldwide rights, African rights. Can you talk more about that, how you were able to get your own rights back and the process you had with most of your books? Okay. To start with, I never, I never give world rights to any publisher. Um, I'm very, very careful about that. Um, and um, frankly, there is no publisher in the U.S. or U.K., who knows this continent as well as I do, you know? So I'm not gonna allow them to, and then have my book here, and then they'll be selling my books for like uh, 15 fifteen dollars or whatever, which I know is not accessible to people who are staying in this country, and I want people to be able to access it. So of course, even with the pricing, I look at the different countries, what is the average cost of books in that country, and how can we put it there? So. So, yeah, that's one. I never give world rights. Um, and there are absolutely a lot of amazing publishers on this continent as well. And I want people, uh, and, and I constantly say this, I want people to look beyond the, the 1884 borders when they're submitting to publishers. You know, if you're in Nigeria, you know, uh, don't just look at Nigerian publishers. If, if, if Lola says, ah, this is not my thing, you know, uh, which probably means you need to rework and it's not good enough because she knows, she knows quality stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there are other publishers on this continent. Take advantage of, you know, uh, South Africa has large publishers and they're generally open to, 
to people submitting manuscripts without necessarily them doing a call out for it. So let's use each other. Let's use all the different platforms. And we've got, obviously, now we've got Lego, Lego's review of books. It's a way to submit short stories and stuff. We've got Johannesburg review of books. We have, my God, it's like only South Africa and Nigeria are doing stuff. <laughs> I'm just joking. There's Bakwa, of course. Yeah, but but there's Bakwa. There is there is a whole lot of other stuff. So let's let's open ourselves up to this, please. Also, want to talk about your publishing journey. How was the publishing process for you what, with the collection of short stories? And look, moving forward, how are you are you working with any publisher? And what has the process been? Yeah, I, I'm I'm published by Griot's Lounge, you know, which is relatively new. Uh, <laughs> Mine, I, I think I di uh, a friend referred me to, you know, just uh, some people who, who actually <laughs> believe in me even more than I do. <laughs> I do believe in myself. So, so and he felt I could, I could send uh, my manuscript to, to Griot's Lounge, and, and I did. It's a simple story, and I did. And, and they liked it and said they were going to publish it. And, and, and so far, I mean, it's, it's, I'm new. I'm new, as, uh, as Ms. Lola said. said, I'm a local champion. <laughs> <laughs> but so far, so good. I mean, uh, we... We've set out. Uh, we went to Ghana, um, and and it's been it's been wonderful because when you have a publisher that is uh, rooting out for you, believes in you first of all, and I mean we, we still have a lot to do. We still have a lot to learn. I mean, so I mean, publishing is not easy. It's not <laughs> it's not like uh, MTN or whatever. You know that you have you have many people that are going to be rushing, you know, to buy your books and all that. But I mean, so far I think uh, it's been good. And um, being here is a wonderful experience. And, I, I, and as the last person said, I don't take it for granted. So it's an opportunity for me to showcase myself. So, uh, so far so good. We're still, we still forward looking and expecting to grow and be like WIDA uh, and uh, Cassava Republic and the other ones in South Africa, yeah. yeah. And before we go into the regions, I think I would also like to ask on the issue of writing, mental health, and personal experiences. So this is to both of you. Do the characters in your writing script into your personal experience, your family, or your relationships? Or do you think also writers need therapy after the, gr the grueling task of a book? <laughs> okay. Uh, in my own case, I'm okay, we're going to be doing a reading later, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, <laughs> I don't know. I feel very, very guilty. But I shouldn't, I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be guilty. The story, <laughs> the story is going to be it's a love story. So I hope you guys are going to like it. But when I was young, I did some. I did a bit of that. I'm not going to tell you what it is. But when it, when it happen, when I start reading, then you will know what I'm saying. So a writer can't afford not to borrow things from one's life. Uh, I mean, there are materials everywhere, and I mentioned before that it's this humanity. Uh, and I'm guided by the principle that, uh, that fiction is not really about life in different places. It's about what life does in different places. It, it's, it's different, you know, it's so, but in other words, it's the same life we're talking about. The same life that South Africans are living, the same life that we are living. The difference might be in the cultural context, this political thing, but the emotions are the same. The emotions that Shakespeare has explored are the same emotions uh, that we are still trying to explore in our in our different uh, fiction. So uh, that's it for me. But, but of course, as of course, as I said, well, historical materials, you know, pictures, photographs, in particular, have played a very big role in my collection. Stories from my father, stories from my friends, you know, soap operas, all the all and all. I mean, all those. But about um, the therapy you're talking about is quite is quite genuine. I mean, I started this story, this book. In 2012, you know, I wrote a very, a, a longish short story, and I liked it. I felt I had done something I haven't hadn't done before. Like it's beautiful. I mean, but if I look at that now, I mean, I feel awful, <laughs> you, you know, because I mean, what was going through me? So it's like it's like it's like taking cocaine or something. You know, you feel so high at the end. The next day, you are so depressed. You feel like just throwing this thing away. And how do you know? <laughs> but anyway. Anyway, you, you, you <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not in South Africa, so I'm safe. <laughs> so, but I mean, some people say when you're depressed, just go for a drink and get back to it. But people like me, I don't know. I feel I feel enslaved to this thing I do. I don't give up. I feel angry. I destroy, and I've I've learned to be ha g gentler on myself because. Those earlier stories I did, when I, whenever the depressing thing came upon me, I would just, just literally destroy it. 
like trash it, you know. But I've decided not to do that because you can salvage a lot from what you feel, depre you know, depressed by. So uh, I'm, I, I feel the writing called me. So I, even when I struggle with it and feel offended by it, like people say, I mean, the, all the glitter about writing is beautiful, beautiful. I mean, but when you are writing, you just feel like you are. I don't know whether to say crap or something. But <laughs> I've said it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you feel awful. But but the thing is, is like it's still natural. It's like the sunrise and sunset. So you feel angry, you feel happy. The next day you feel sad. You wake up, oh, like ah, that's beautiful, you know. Uh, so I don't know whether I don't know about therapy, but but writing itself is therapeutic because I mean there are sometimes you feel so awful, and then I actually I started writing out of sad feelings. I mean, I, I didn't grow up wanting to be a writer. I just, I just started feeling kind of, I don't know, I don't, th I don't think the word is sad, but I felt like something was making me not as happy as I was before, and I grabbed my pen and started writing, and I felt happier afterwards. So it's, uh, it's this way and that, you know, you, it depresses you, it picks you up, it, it lifts you, it breaks you down. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. Yeah, but <laughs> specifically, I also wanted to ask, do, does a story impact you in such a way that the story, not the creative writing, the creative process this, this time around, the story on its own having a toll on you. Do you experience that? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, although not in the, oh, I, I, yeah, I remember in this collection, um, but there's a story, you know, about the slave, slave trade in Libya, that, that which we all know. I mean, I wrote it and I, at a point I felt, I felt horrible being not just a black man, but being a human being. I mean, how could this go on on the continent? How could Africans do this to themselves? So, and there's an earlier story that I, I, I was writing, and at a point, I just broke down and started crying. I mean, it hasn't happened recently, but that's, that's the kind of toll it can, it can take, apart from the normal depressing uh, thing that comes with writing generally. <laughs> normal depressing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because um, your novel, I'm not giving anything away, of course, but I put myself in the position of the person writing that, and I felt it, it will really take a toll on me to be the person writing that. So I don't know how it was. Well, it was, it was emotionally, um, it's, it's, the most, it's the most intense novel that I've ever written. So it, was, it rung me emotionally, and it's the only book that I've ever written that after, after it got published, I've never been able to read it from beginning to end because it's, it's a lot. I'm also a mother to a son, so it didn't help like every time I would, I would look at people and yeah, so I had to, when I finished the final, 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 when I went through the proofs and I submitted, I just like took a good week where I just stayed at, stayed at home. I didn't, I didn't interact with anybody. I just needed to like exhale you know, uh, and, and, I w and I was reading a lot of like uh, light stuff and so that I could, I could, I could, yeah, I could laugh and try to decompress and all that. Um, I think we'll go to the readings, start with you Inamdi, then we get to the audience after the readings. This is the one I told you about earlier. And uh, since we are in northern Nigeria, I think I should just read a story from Nigeria. And it's also set in northern Nigeria. It's titled, My Beloved Infidel. <laughs> the first day I saw Ifunaya in our area in Mpape, <coughs> near Meitama, my heart fluttered wildly, and I hurried to the mosque to pray. I knew that I loved her, but how could that be? I was 15, and I was Muslim. I was Hausa, and she was Igbo. She was about my age, but from her eyes, I could say that she was a little younger than me. Her mother, Madame Ngozi, had just moved into our area. She didn't move in quietly as a newcomer should. We had heard that she had bought a small piece of land from Madame Mustafa, my Baba, and quickly built a one-bedroom apartment I knew she took more space than Baba gave her. But Baba did not worry, because nothing was permanent where we lived. The FCT minister could send his bulldozers anytime and turn a sprawl of houses and shacks into rubble. So we didn't really care, even if Ifunanya's mother took the whole of our area in Mpape to herself. 
She built a small house that ate much of the road the way a greedy Fulani cow eats from the grass to the cassava. This house was a restaurant, and it became popular because soon after its first day, news spread quickly in my neighborhood that Madame Ngozi's food was very delicious. She named this restaurant Ifunanya Restaurant. I battled my feelings for Ifunaya the way headsmen battled with stubborn bulls. It was bad because when Ifunaya came near our house, her hair exposed, her arms uncovered, her thighs visible to me. I didn't feel angry the way I felt when I saw my 10-year-old sister Halima without her hijab one afternoon talking with a Muslim boy. But with Ifunaya, I felt as if I had malaria. <laughs> my body began to shake. My voice trembled as if I had seen a jinn. I did not stop my prayers. I prayed more than five times a day. I fasted. I asked her to kill the feeling I was having for an infidel. <laughs> then the dreams of her began. In the worst of the dreams, she wrapped jeweled arms around me. Her sweet fire consumed me, and I woke up feeling sick of my bed. How could this be? I took the Holy Quran and turned to the story of Ibrahim, may peace be upon him, ready to sacrifice his son Ismaila. But my mind drifted away from the book, and I saw myself in Ifunanya's arms, gazing <laughs> into her lovely eyes. When it dawned on me how sinful my thoughts had become, I cried to Allah, the most beneficent and most merciful, to have mercy on me. I prayed and purified myself with water. The next day, when I was returning from the mosque, a girl ran to me with a folded full paper. Her name was Ninadi. She was seven, and her blue hijab was big. And when she ran, the breeze swelled it up, and in the distance, she appeared to me like a giant butterfly. I took the paper and opened it up. Something was written in blue ink. Hello, Hassan. Why do you shake whenever you see me? <laughs> Ifunaya. At the sight of the name Ifunaya, my heart began to explode. I placed the hand on the left side of my chest. How could this be? An infidel was writing to me. What she want from me? Was I not doing enough to avoid her? The reply her, a thought said to me, tell her to leave you alone. But I could not that. The Holy Quran and began to read. I do not remember now what I read, but it was as if the words of the book turned into a story about me and Ifunaya. I took a piece of paper and wrote, Ifunaya, Wallahi, I do not know, Hassan. <laughs> I searched for Ninadi. I knew it was sinful to look for her, but I searched for her through the cluster of houses and tin shacks and refuse dumps that lay carelessly like the shoes of worshippers outside our cream-colored mosque. I sidestepped the sewage that ran from the tin-walled bathrooms behind houses. I avoided the droves of cattle passing the street with saliva sloshing out of their mouths, slow and indifferent as their headers wall up them with sticks. I avoided being hit by okadas scooting past, impatience in their riders' eyes. I passed through cellars of suya and watermelons, tangerines, oranges, and pineapples. They called out to me, but I turned my face away. A seller of music CDs, a Yoruba man whose shop was full of music albums from King Sonia days to Two Faced Dibias, was loudly playing an Onye Kawenu song. I knew that my heart was dirty now, like this place and its music, that my heart was neat before Ifunanya came into our area, neat like the newest houses in Guarimpa Housing Estate. I found Ninadi playing with other children near a barber's shop full of pictures of black American musicians. I looked away from the picture of the fat and heavily bearded Ray Cross and Rihanna, who had red hair. Ninadi, I called. Zo? Her face lit up as soon as she saw me. Then she ran to me. Yeah, yeah, I said. La fear, she answered. Her cheeks bunched up in a smile. Her eyes narrowed into two slits. Take this to her, Kinji. She nodded her head. If an eye are cool. <laughs> I I looked sideways to make sure that nobody overheard our conversation. Yes. Kawokudi manna hasan, she said, stretching out her hand, smiling almost craftily. She had turned her meal running into a business. I smiled and gave in. 
I dipped my hand in my trouser pocket and took out a 10 naira note. Nago de, she thanked, exposing an incomplete set of front teeth. That evening, I got a reply from Ifunaya. Hassan, say your mind and be free. <laughs> I am waiting for you in Ifunaya restaurant. Ifunaya. I wrote on the same paper without letting the nadi go. I drew a heart and wrote my name under it. The next morning, I saw Ninadi, my speedy courier, with a note from my beloved infidel. Sweet Hassan, I love you too. Kisses and hugs, Ifunanya. My heart beat wildly in my chest. But how could this be in such a dirty place as my area? This was not the place of love. It was the place of filth and sewage and meat water and prostitutes and Morocco smokers. Thank you. That is just a teaser. The book is available at the bookstore. Zuki? <laughs> I apologize in advance uh, because you're laughing now, you're about to cry. Because <laughs> um, I'm getting a bit somber. Uh, this is Journal of Zuko Spencer Romali. 9 June 2008. I hate watching the news. The cover of this book says Diary 2008. It was one of the presents I got from Nana and Grandpa Gianni for Christmas last year. Grandpa Gianni isn't old, but he said I should call him Grandpa. The diary has Nana and Grandpa on the cover. She says they'll give me one every year so I can improve my writing. Nana said I should use it to write my feelings or thoughts, when I'm happy or sad. Grandpa Gianni said real men don't cry sometimes, real men cry sometimes, and it is good. Comrade Uncle heard and whispered to me that real African men don't cry, and we are real African men. Daddy said diary sounds girly, and I should call it a journal instead. Mommy called it semantics and laughed. Sometimes grown-ups can be so confusing. Oh, and I need to look in the dictionary to see what the meaning of semantics is. So I'm writing this in my journal, not diary. I had nothing to say earlier in the year, so I did not write. I wish I did not have to watch the news. Daddy and Mommy have been getting me to watch the news since I was seven, and then I go to bed so that I can know what is happening in the world. Nowadays, my bed on the news the other day. I saw a man getting burnt. Mommy tried to cover my eyes, but I'd already seen. People were chased away from their homes. Women who sell tomatoes and onions had their things overturned as they were chased by people with jambox. Daddy spelt it for me. It's a South African whip. The people who chased others also had sticks and other weapons. At school, my teacher, Miss Clark is her name, told us that's the xenophobic. She taught us how to spell the word. Such a pretty word. Such an ugly meaning. Attacks happen because the government does not know how to control, control people coming from Africa. So South Africans get angry because the Africans take away their jobs and things. When I asked Daddy why they were beating up Africans, he got cross. He told me I'm also an African. Mommy got me to help make soup and took me to give bread and soup to one of the camps where the victims of xenophobia are staying. They stay in tents and there are some toilets. The toilets are the kind one sees at shows and things, but these ones do not flush. So when I went into one, it was very dirty. As Mommy, Auntie Norma and their other friends were giving out the soup. I talked to some of the boys. They were not clean, but they were nice. I played football with them and scored a goal. On Saturday, Comrade Uncle came and picked me up from home for shakes. I told him what my teacher said. He said Miss Clark does not know what she's saying. Well, he said she was full of bull, and I told him he said a bad word, and he said sorry. So he told me that my teacher does not know what she's talking about. 
He told me that those Africans have a right to be here just as we do. No African is a foreigner on African soil, he said. Then he told me that the people who were beating up others were ignorant. They want the government to do everything for them. They're jealous of their neighbors instead of learning from them. I keep having bad dreams of that man with a tire around his neck, burning while people are standing and laughing. If I were president, I would ask the army to shoot all the people who were laughing instead of helping that man. South Africans are not nice people. I'm a nice person. I'm not South African. Just African, like Comrade Uncle said. So we have roughly about 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Do you have a roving mic? Hello, everyone. This has been an amazing panel. Um, I'm TJ Benson. Um, my first question goes to Namdi. Um, this is a short story collection, yes? Yes. Yeah, so why are you? <laughs> okay, they want to see me. Okay. <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask about um, how the book is uh, moving in the world because there seems to be this. Um, thing where they look down on short stay collections that it's not really a book they feel you haven't done a novel yet. In fact, when publishers are pressured into, or when they have to publish a mm -hmm. short stay collection, they market it as a novel. Um, I, I, when I was going through the program, I sort of chuckled when I saw, it describes, uh, it says two book, um, the two no and the novel, novels. So I don't laugh at you. But I don't know, um, do, you, do you feel, is, this, is there this sense you feel, like you feel like, oh, maybe when you do a novel, then you have done a book or, you feel complete, this book feels complete in itself. Mm. That's what I was going to ask you then. For um, Zuhizwa, you've traveled a lot through Africa. And from where you just read now, the character seems to be experiencing this, um, is it identity crisis where because of um, what um, his people are doing, he doesn't feel any longer, he doesn't feel like part of them anymore. Or something. So I, I don't. This tension. I, we don't see it online. At least from what we see. You know, when these things come on on Twitter, for example, the what we see are people saying, "No, oh, this is our land. This is our space. So you guys have to leave and everything." But from your book, we are seeing a different narrative, a different side to this. So how do um, people in these regions, if you are part of people who are doing this oppression and you're experiencing this, uh, how do you navigate that identity um, crisis from being from the place of the oppressor but you feel like you're not part of them? Okay, okay. But it's just, I actually feel surprised that people, uh, short story collections seem not to do as well as novels. I don't understand it. Musicians, you know, do singles, white or right. And then when they want to launch themselves in a big way, they do albums and albums are like you know like short stories <laughs> stories and and they sell in millions and i don't know why it you know it doesn't work doesn't work that way really. <laughs> i feel somehow a sense of uh, of uh, marginalization <laughs> <laughs> marginalization but but i think uh, some people some collections of short stories have done well petina gappa's short story collection did well Ye young lee's sh short story collection did well uh, so those things kind of inspire me, and I think that in the magazines, both uh, well, I don't like to say locally, but you know, on the continent and beyond, doing well, like uh, the New Yorker and all that, and Granta, they don't ask for novels, although they might ask for excerpts, you know. So it means that I, that's why I say I don't get it because the short story collection, I I I can tend to un, uh, understand the point that you know some people feel that they don't get deep into the character and things before it's all over, and some short stories seem not to be resolved and all that, but there are some satisfying short stories, you know, and and the, the magazines that I mentioned have made short story uh, short stories very very popular, and I don't think we should lose faith, you know, uh, and I don't necessarily think that you should do a novel. Uh, because if you are naturally a short story writer and you venture into the novel, uh, it might not sit in. And some, some people who are careful readers might sense that you just want to appeal to your agent or something like that. You know, uh, how my book is doing, you asked about that, right? Uh, 
Well, we'll see at the end of the show. <laughs> Thanks for that, Namdi. I was actually also thinking that I wouldn't trade Leslie Nekarima's short story Leslie. collection for anything in the world, for any novel in the world. Yeah, but um, I, to answer your question, it's actually a child narrating. So there is that. Um, regarding online, uh, what you call it, I think uh, we also must avoid um, that, that, that generally people, I think, for instance, every year I've said something about it. Sisonkem Simang has generally said something about it. Shoma Josi uh, has said something, who grew up in Tanzania, has said something. So that people, uh, uh, Swangene has said something about it, that people, uh, Natalia has said something about it. So perhaps maybe uh, we'd, we'd, we don't have the pedigree, but we certainly, there are people who genuinely talk about this. But beyond this, um, try to find out exactly how can we get into a space where this doesn't keep happening. And I am of the belief that, you know, m excuse my conspiracy theory, but I, I kind of believe it. I'm of the belief, every time there's a big issue that's happening in South Africa that's government related, suddenly there's an Afrophobic attack, you know, and we get distracted from that issue. So for instance, we're supposed to have the president's bank, re uh, uh, bank account results like exposed by the public protector just before the recent Afrophobic attacks. And um, there was also somebody uh, who was supposed to go and be a witness at a commission. And this guy was supposed to be a witness at the commission, was CEO of some company, and he died under mysterious circumstances. Just around the same time, then Afrophobic attacks started, you know? And it, every time, even when there were like the, the, the last uh, Zuma Mas 4 protest before that, there were Afrophobic attacks. Every time, it's like, it's almost like it's engineered by a certain group so that we all get distracted and we don't question, we're not questioning power. Any other hands? Okay. My name is Chike Ophili. Might I know from you, the um, short story writer to the right, um, do you think that short story, like somebody had asked earlier, is um, an unfinished work, one? Do you think like a copywriter in advertising aspires to making a film that a, that a short story writer somewhat seemed to, to aspire also? also? to write in the big novel. And so to get to the sun, he has to first of all visit the moon on his way to the sun. Do you have that notion of short, write, short story writing? And do you also think that short story actually is the poetry of the narrative fiction? Because it condenses like poetry does when you put an entire ocean in a capsule. Do you see short story as poetry of prose fiction. For my sister to the left, do you think Malema, the dynamic Malema of South Africa, is in his economic search, because the very center of his entire political um, drive in South Africa is to set South Africans free from economic um, abandonment. Do you think it is the collateral damage of that drive that is costing the rest of Africa their lives in South Africa and making South Africa a very ungrateful country? <laughs> can, I, can I answer first? Of course. Uh, I think it will, be, it, it will be very problematic for anybody to uh, blame um, a government, a, a, a party that's not in power. Malema is not in power in South Africa, so, um, but South Africa is one of the most grossly in unequal countries in the world. Um, the rich are very rich, and, and the poor are very poor. So there is that what you call it, and we do have, we had, uh, what happened to us at independence 
with the rest of the continent, uh, what happened at Independence is um, the people who looked like us uh, got into space and they wanted to take them Zungu space, you know. With South Africa, uh, what we got was we got, um, we got an anthem, which is kind of mishmashed. We got a flag, and we got um, a vote every five years to be able to vote for a president. Now, frankly, uh, every football club has that, <laughs> you know? So we didn't get the economic part of the country, of what we needed. So a lot of, a lot of land is, is, is not owned by us. I mean, you have like some sheiks from Qatar who own land in South Africa. A lot of, uh, most of the companies on the Job Stock Exchange are not, are not owned by, by people who look like me. And if they have CEOs who look like me, they're usually the acceptable ones to capital. Not anybody will say, oh, we're going to do transformation. We're going to make sure that the best people are in the jobs and change, change. So, yeah. In fact, we've had like a lot of corporates fall down. We've had stand off. We have, uh, what you call it, and they're, they're run by white people, and they're never made as accountable as, say, when a government department loses two million rand, you know? So there is that narrative as well. So I think we need to look at it holistically, and we need uh, to look at our relationship as a continent holistically as well, you know? Um, I like to think that uh, Nigeria, Ghana, all the other African countries that helped uh, during apartheid did it because it was the right thing to do, not because anybody owes them now. Okay. In okay. one minute, okay, one minute. Out of I'll tie your first question with the third. You know, I don't think the, think the short story is poetry, but I can say it's, it's closest to poetry in impact and in brevity. You know, so, you know, it's miniaturized but it is impactful, just like the poem. So it's not like the novel that is extended uh, in order to deliver its impact. You have to pressurize it, so to speak, and it just goes like a volcanic eruption. And I don't think uh, the, the, the short story is like, uh, you know, the journey to the moon. I mean, how did you say it? Yeah, you know, I mean, you should, you know, you should do your thing. I mean, just, uh, it's, and also you said it's whether it's complete, it, it's complete in its own way. The problem is when people try to write the short story as if it's a novel. And so, you know, it becomes novelistic in, spo in scope and all that, and it tends to have many characters. And so you can just take the first, the first sh short story, the first draft, as a chap first chapter of a novel. But a carefully crafted short story, you know, is, is self-sufficient. Uh, I don't think you, you need to prove yourself. I don't, need, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think the short story is a learning experience for you to gra graduate into the novel, you know, so that's it. Thank you, Namdi. Thank you, Zikiswa. Thank you, Kaduna. It's been a pleasure. A huge, huge thank you also to Sada, who's done a fantastic job. May we uh, remind